And with that, let's get into the Word. Really looking forward to what God has for us today in verse 19 of Philippians chapter 4. If you're not there, I'll have you turn there. And if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along. If not, where you're seated is fine. This is a well-known verse in God's Word. It's a powerful verse, a powerful promise, as we're going to see. The Apostle Paul says by the Spirit, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. Let's pray, if you would, join with me. We'll ask God to bless this to our understanding. Loving Heavenly Father, we want to posture ourselves before You this morning with humble hearts, settled minds, and willing hearts to receive that which you would desire to speak into our lives in our time together today in your word. Lord, please do not allow anything to distract us or to cause us to have our minds wander. Lord, please enable us by the Holy Spirit to focus and to concentrate. In Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I want to start a little bit differently today and begin by asking a question. The question is this, and think it through. Can you recall a time in your Christian life when you had a legitimate need that God, for whatever reason, did not meet? Let me ask the same question in a different way. As you think back over the years that you've been walking with the Lord, can you think of even one time where you found yourself in a place of legitimate need and you cried out to the Lord and prayed and asked and God just, for whatever reason, did not meet that need? Notice that I'm qualifying this question with the word legitimate. I do so because oftentimes we perceive a want or even a desire as being a need. The promise that we have from God is that He will meet our every need. He will provide for anything and everything that we legitimately need. We do not have such a promise from God to give us whatever we want, when we want it, at the time we want it, in the color we want it, in the way we want it. Does that sound a little bit like a five-year-old? It should. Now, it is true that God, in His grace, will grant us something that we want. And even more so, there are those times when God will give us the desires of our heart, but not before first placing that desire on our heart, when we delight in Him, as the psalmist says. Delight yourself in the Lord, 
and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, please know that that does not mean that anything we desire, oh Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz? (laughs) Sorry, I had a flashback. In other words, it's not whatever you desire, God is going to give you the desire of your heart. No, God prior puts that desire on your heart and makes that desire a delight. And then when you delight in Him and that desire that He has put on your heart, He then gives you the desire of your heart. That's how it works. Now here's the thing. God will only give us that which we want, that which we desire, and certainly that which we need when it's according to His will, and in His time, and for His glory. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Actually, This is the source of much in the way of misunderstanding on the part of God's people. I know for myself, and you'll forgive the self-reference, but early on in my Christian life, I found myself many times just really not understanding why it is that God would not answer some of my prayers, especially when I had so many promises in God's Word that said that He would give me that which I had asked. I think it comes when we misunderstand the promises in God's Word, of which there are many. One has counted over 3,000, 3,000 promises in the Word of God. Think about that. But some of those promises, I would even venture to say many of those promises, come packaged with specific conditions. They're conditional promises. Example, one that we just saw here in Philippians chapter 4 earlier, in verses 6 and 7. The promise is this, that we have access to this peace that only God can give. Jesus said, I I come to give you peace, not as the world gives. This is the peace that only He can give. Paul describes it as this peace that surpasses, see it as bypasses your mind, which says everything around you is anything but peaceful. So it bypasses, surpasses your human understanding and comprehension and sets up this guard around your heart to keep you at peace in spite of what's happening in your life. That's the promise. But there are three conditions that that promise is predicated upon. The first of which is that we are to pray about everything. Second, we are to thank God for anything. And if we will pray about everything and thank God for anything, then we will worry about no thing. That's the conditional promise. Here's another one, very uh, well known proverb. We memorize it. We sing it. We have it up on our wallpaper. We have it up on our walls (laughs) in our homes. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Acknowledge the Lord in all your ways. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And here's the promise. He will direct your paths. He, I like the translation that renders it this way better, He will make your path straight. See it as He will straighten it out. He will straighten this mess (laughs) that you're in. He will straighten it all out. He will work it all out. He will direct your steps and straighten out your path. But 
there are again three conditions to the realizing of that powerful promise in God's Word. First and foremost, we are not to lean on our own understanding. And isn't it true that when we don't lean on our own understanding, we do <laughs> trust in Him with all of our heart? Because we can't trust in our own understanding. We don't have any understanding. And we also acknowledge Him in all of our ways. And when those three conditions are met, then the promise is realized. And such is the case with the promise before us today. I think we do well to drill down into this verse by looking at the conditions that must be first met before God will supply and meet all of our needs. I think in so doing, we'll have a better understanding of just how powerful and profound this promise really is. Now, the first condition is not so easily recognized at first read, but it's that of this promise being proportionate. And I'll explain what I mean by that. This promise is not a blanket promise. And I say that by virtue of how Paul, with specificity, notice, says, my God will supply all your needs. That's an interesting detail, and the specificity is there for a reason. It's specific to those who give, because they give, as the Philippians had. And as such, God responds in kind by meeting all of their needs. In other words, proportionate to their meeting Paul's needs, so too did God meet all their needs according to the riches in Christ. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, it's recorded, chapter 6, verse 38. Notice how the emphasis is on the proportion, the portion. The measure that we use, Paul says, will be the same measure that is used when we receive. The measure we use, the gauge we use, the amount, the portion we use when we give, that will be the same portion that will be used when we receive. Now listen to what Jesus says. He actually takes it a step further and raises the bar, if I can say it that way. He says, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, let it settle, get more in there, and then keep pouring <laughs> until it's running over, and it will be poured into your lap. Oh, I like that. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, I know that this is chiefly in the context of financial giving, financial support. But please, make no mistake about it. This is a principle that applies across the board when it comes to our giving, and when it comes to our needs, and when it comes to God supplying, providing, meeting all of our needs. Now, there's something else here that I need to point out, and it has to do with Paul only writing this to the Philippians. This is interesting. I point this out because this specific promise was not written to the Thessalonians. It wasn't written to the churches in Colossia, or it was, certainly wasn't written to the Corinthians. It was only written to, by the Spirit of God, 
the church there in Philippi. And don't think for a second that the Philippian church was wealthy. They were not. It could be argued that they were in fact very impoverished. And it's for this reason that their giving was both done sacrificially and generously, so much so that Paul is one of those places where the Apostle Paul is sort of in a sanctified way shaming the churches. Listen to what he says to the Corinthian church in his second epistle, chapter 11, verse 8. He says, I robbed other churches, the church in Philippi, I think it was pretty strong. It's kind of like I, I stole from them. He didn't steal, of course. It was freely given. But I think he's trying to make a point here. I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. That's what I mean by a sanctified shaming. Can you imagine? You have to understand, too, that when these letters were written, they were delivered to the church and read aloud to the church. Could you imagine being in church that day? Man, I, if I was there, that would have been a day that I wish I were sick and <laughs> didn't go to church because, <laughs> I mean, he's telling them, you know, you guys, the only way I was able to serve you, minister to you, was by way of the support that I got from this church that gave to me and supported me financially so I could. I'm keenly aware that this second condition may seem like a firm grasp of the obvious, but it's important nonetheless. Whatever that need is, must be good. If it's not good, God's not going to provide it. I mean, I, I say it as simple as that. And here again, I would suggest that this is one of the main reasons we misunderstand the goodness of God in meeting our needs. We pray and we ask God for that which we perceive to be a need, and when He doesn't meet it, when He doesn't answer it, when He doesn't provide it, we become disenchanted, disappointed, discouraged. The problem is that we don't know what God knows. Again, I know that's a firm grasp of the obvious. His ways are not our ways. They're so much higher, infinitely higher. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In other words, we don't think the way God thinks. Could you imagine if we thought the way God thought? I mean, shoot me now. We're all doomed, right? He would not be God if that were the case. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. It has to be good or God will withhold it for our own good. Perhaps you've heard it said, I thank God for answered prayer, but sometimes I am more thankful for the prayers that God did not answer. I look back over my prayer list, which I've kept for, oh my goodness, since I was a new believer, 37 years. And I go back to those early prayer requests that I still have, I just, I find myself apologizing to God for praying that prayer back then. Oh Lord, I'm so sorry. Here, here I'm praying for this, and, and God's just going, mm -mm. <laughs> you don't want that. No, I want it. I need it. I need this, Lord. No, you don't. <laughs> I can just picture the angels in heaven given charge concerning me going, you don't want that. Don't ask for that. Thankfully, God's not going to give you that, because if God were to give you what you're asking for, it would destroy your life. Example, for those of you, and I know none of you here, I'm talking about other carnal Christians who pray that they win the lottery. Don't pray that. 
Have you seen what happens to people who win the lottery? Their lives are destroyed. They even have TV shows. I, I was flipping through the channels one time. It was a long time ago, a while back. And I came across this. I don't know, I don't know if they still have it, but it was a, a, a series on lottery winners and how their lives were completely destroyed. And I'm thinking to myself, are, you know, and I know there's, there's some of us who think to ourselves, well, I would tithe on the winnings if I, Lord, just if you let me win the lottery. <laughs> okay. I have to confess this. I, I was a very new believer. And as I've already confessed, I, I struggled with this, you know, particular area in my Christian walk. But when I was uh, um, uh, in, the, in the business, I prayed and I said, God, if you'll give me, I'm sorry, forgive me. I hope you don't see me differently when I share this, okay? Full disclosure, I was a very young, immature believer. Did I say that? Okay. Lord, I, I, I really wanted to drive a Mercedes-Benz 450 SL convertible. I prayed. I said, God, if you'll give me a Mercedes-Benz 450 SL, I will take people to church. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. You've prayed similar prayers, haven't you? You haven't? Let's close in prayer then, because... <laughs> I've heard it said this way, and this has been such an encouragement to me in this regard. If I knew what God knew, I would answer my own prayers the way that God does. Let me say the same thing in a different way. God answers all our prayers, meets all our needs the way we would if we knew what He knew. The problem is we don't know. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's good. He knows what's not good. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, every good, not just good, but perfect gift, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down, from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change His mind. He gives us what we need, and it's always good, and it's always perfect. And let me add, the timing is always perfect too. See, sometimes it is a legitimate need. But God will deem it necessary to delay, as Isaiah 30, 18 says, so that He can be gracious unto you. Meaning that God's delays are not God's denials. He's delaying for a reason, and perhaps for a season. I like how one quipped. It's so good, and it's so true. When God says no, I completely botched. This is why I use notes, by the way. You ask God for something. You have a legitimate need. And God may respond by saying, the timing is wrong, slow. He may respond by saying, you're wrong, grow. He may respond by saying, the request is wrong, no. But when the timing is right, and you're right, and the request is right, God says, go. Here's the thing, God's answering your prayer. You just may not like the answer. He's either going to answer it in one of three ways. Yes, no, no, why not? Because <laughs> it's not good for you, trust me. Or thirdly, He might answer with, I hate this word. Wait. I hate to wait. 
I was sharing with somebody uh, last week about a time when God had to get through to me in this area. It was many years ago, again, when I was a young believer and on the mainland and so impatient, always in a hurry, hate to wait. I mean, I go into a line at the grocery store. You know how this is, right? And there's always somebody in front of you that has a check that they want to cash to get supervisor approval from Zimbabwe. (laughs) And then you think you're clever when you sneak into the other line, and then it's worse. And the person that was behind you in the line you just left gets out before you, and your sanctification flees from you. Okay, I feel better now. I just had to get that off my chest. (laughs) I hate to wait. I hate to wait. So you know it's bad when God has to get through to you through a personalized license plate. You know, <laughs> you know it's bad when God has to speak into your life by way of a car that you've never seen before, cutting you off, pulling out in front of you, slowing you down with a personalized license plate with an H, a 2, a W and an 8. Hate to wait. And it was right close in proximity to my house. I drive that road every day. I had never seen that car before, and I had never seen that car since. I am convinced that it was driven by an angel, unaware, (laughs) that was dispatched to my location in order to get my attention. Because, you know, I, I can be stubborn and obstinate, and thick-headed. I know none of you know what I speak of. And so God has to somehow get my attention. And so sometimes the best thing that God can do for me and for you is to say, not yet. Just wait. Then, when God moves His mighty hand as only He can on our behalf to meet that need. Oh my goodness. One of my favorite promises in the Word of God is Romans 8, 32. Listen to this. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, Listen to the rhetorical question that Paul by the Spirit writes and asks. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Did you catch that? In other words, you have a need. Yes, I do. It may not be a financial need. Maybe your need is for something else. Maybe it's that prodigal son or that wayward daughter. And you've been praying and crying out to God for years for them. Maybe it's for a loved one that you've been praying for, for their salvation. Maybe the need is something else, a physical healing, a physical, a a healing touch from the mighty hand of God. Maybe your need is for peace, for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Maybe your need is for strength. Whatever that need is, you fill in the blank and superimpose that need on this promise. Because this promise is saying that if God would not withhold His only begotten Son that He gave because He so loved the world, Is there anything good that He would withhold from you? I mean, just think logically with me through this. You have a need. God did not withhold His Son, which was your greatest need for a Savior, right? It's been said that our greatest need was His greatest deed, coming and dying and paying in full for all of our sins. Our greatest need was His greatest deed. Now, how is it possible? There's almost some 
sanctified sarcasm again, if I can say that on the part of the Apostle Paul. He's almost being sarcastic. I mean, how does that even make sense? That if God is not willing to withhold His only begotten Son, that He's going to withhold that need from you? Think about it. Here you are, Lord. Oh, I need Thee. Oh, Lord, I need Thee. Every hour I need Thee. Oh, Lord. And we cry out to Him, and He hearkens under the voice of our cry, under the banner of His willingness to send His only begotten Son. Here's another uh, way to think of it, and then we'll try to bring it in for a landing here. Notice I said try. That's, uh, <laughs> bear with me. We're trusting God when that trumpet sounds, that the dead in Christ will rise first, as we're going to talk about a little bit in our prophecy update. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up, raptured up, to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. We're trusting God to do that. And we can't trust Him for this month's rent. We can't trust Him for this need that we have in our lives? How does that make any sense? Why would God withhold anything good from us? If it's good, it's God. And He will provide whatever it is, if it's good. If it's good, you got it. Kind of sound like a Toyota commercial from back in the day. You got it, Toyota. Okay, sorry. If it's good, God's going to meet it. Now, it's when these conditions are met that we can be assured of this magnificent promise from God to meet all our needs. And not only do we have the assurance of all of our needs being met, we also have the assurance that the source is inexhaustible. It's infinite. It's inexhaustible. In other words, God will meet all our needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. Listen to what Paul said to the Ephesian church, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to Him who is able, I love this, I love this, I love this, to do exceedingly abundant above all, exceedingly abundant above all, and then sometimes 10 to the 20th power ad infinitum. All that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The riches that we have unfettered access to, given to us exceedingly abundantly above all, think about this, that we could have even asked for. In other words, sometimes God will just give us something that we're not even asking for that we even, don't even know we need, <laughs> or even think we need. Ask or think. It is abundant, exceedingly so, and inexhaustible. One of my favorite examples is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. We're introduced to this vulnerable widow who cries out to the prophet Elisha because the creditors are coming to take her two sons into slavery, which is what they did then. They didn't have bankruptcy. They didn't have chapter 13 or chapter 11 to reorganize. If you had debts you couldn't pay, you had to 
have your son sold into slavery to pay the debt. If you didn't have sons, you were sold into slavery to pay that debt. She doesn't have the money to pay the debts, and they're about to come and take her sons. So she cries out to Elisha. Elisha asks her, what do you have in your house? And she tells him that she really doesn't have anything but one jar with some oil in it. So Elisha tells her to go and borrow empty vessels. And he's very specific. He says, not just a few, get as many as you can. So she does. And then she takes those vessels and she pours from that jar that she had, what little she had, and keeps on pouring, keeps on pouring. Fills up one vessel, puts it off to the side. Fills up another one, puts it off to the side. Keeps doing that until there are no more vessels. And we're told that the oil stopped flowing when she runs out of vessels. So Elisha then instructs her to go and sell the oil and pay off all of her debts. And there's even enough left over for her to live on the rest. And she does. And in so doing, she saves her sons. Now, think about this. We're like this widow, aren't we? We have the absolute assurance that God will meet all, and I mean all, our legitimate needs. That was a legitimate need. Now what's striking to me is that the narrative seems to indicate that had she had more vessels, that oil would have kept flowing. In other words, the more she had, the more would have been filled. Now why do I mention this? Because it speaks to this aforementioned inexhaustible supply that is ours for the asking. You know what though? <laughs> Sadly, many of us could be guilty of what James says, you have not because you ask not. I'll tell you something the Lord's been ministering to me, are all of those things that I could have asked for that were there for the asking that I never had, because I didn't ask. Here's God waiting with this inexhaustible supply to keep the oil flowing. There's a, 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 a passage in Zechariah, where Zechariah for nine years, they're, they're working, they're building, and it just seems like they didn't even put a dent in the construction. He's discouraged, so are all the Israelites. And then God appears to him and shows him two enormous olive trees and underneath is this huge golden bowl, and in the middle a lampstand. And these olives would fall into the bowl, be pressed, and the oil would provide this inexhaustible supply to the lamp, keeping it lit. You know, oil in the Scriptures is a type, a picture of the Holy Spirit. This inexhaustible supply that is ours by way of the Holy Spirit that indwells us, enables us, empowers us. Let me say lastly, she had little oil, but she had a big God. I want to just flip that around, because I think sometimes we put the butt in the wrong spot. Hear me out. I didn't say, she knows she has a big God, but she's only got a little bit of oil. No. She has a little bit of oil, but she has a big God. 
you'll forgive me for saying this. I know that you know that I don't mean to say it this way, but I think you get the point. You need to make sure, <laughs> I'm gonna, I better not say it that way. Where is your B-U-T? There, there we go. <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> you get the point, right? Where is your B-U-T? I know I have a big God, but I got this huge need. No, no, no. You have a huge need, but you have a bigger God who will meet that need. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. What a powerful promise, Lord. And it's ours. It's ours for the asking. Lord, I pray that none of us here today would be numbered amongst those of whom it could be said, they have not because they ask not. Rather, I pray that we would be numbered amongst those of whom it is said, they asked and they received. They sought the Lord. They knocked, and the door was opened. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.